I'm gonna try to make this as entertaining as possible. And, and also the, 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 uh, what I wanna show you a, a bit or talk about is uh, really to think about the future, it's already here. Some place in the world, there are things that you will become familiar with. And, and the question is, when does it show up on our doorsteps? And so the, some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about the future is really what I think is gonna be important in our future in education. So um, and now I, I've done a little bit of um, kind of uh, the research, and there, there are a lot of smart people who do this. Um, the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report, anybody have heard of that, right? They, they got real experts who do this, who think about this thing. So what I've, what I've did is I've pulled out a few things because I wanted to satisfy the need, what's going on, so let's refer to the, the other people. But the, the, these folks are really smart about this stuff. And so they, they've broken it down into what's going to come up, and this was 2013, because I think it's good to see what did people think a few years ago, what was going to happen, and is this stuff happening? So they said MOOCs, right? How many people remember those? And now we begin to look at what happens to that. Tablet computing, all right? What's out in two to three years? Games, right? And, and there, there's questions really around how you begin to think about the, what makes a simulation into a game. In, in part, and so, but you have a lot of these simulations part there. And then they talk about 3D printing and wearable technology, right? And, and how many people are wearing technology in various ways, right? All different ways, and the question is how, how then that affects education. So then we say, well, they, they made in 2013 flip classrooms. Is that something we're talking about here? Starting to see that? Learner analytics, we had discussions last night around understanding more and more about what the students are doing, the impacts on our own institution, how are they graduating, and kind of Paul's question, Angela, around once I've completed it, what's the rate at which they pass those exams? And you're going, I think it's gonna work and we've aligned it, but over time, it, that evidence will help us inform us, are we doing the right way of teaching in the various ways? these various ways. And I think feedback is so important and I think this is where learner analytics come in. So then again, the, they like 3D printing and again it's two or three years out on the second year. And then we have quantified self and virtual assistance. So quantified self, what, anybody have an idea what, what do you think quantified self is? Yeah, Bra. So who am I? I've walked this number of steps today, right? And here's, right, you got it, right? It's all who you are, and now suddenly there's all these metrics, right, around, around these things. And, and I think one of the things we, we begin to think about in the learning process is how do we develop our students' metacognitive skills, their knowledge about their own thinking processes, right? And how does technology help reveal to them what have I done in my life? What have I accomplished? But what's going to be very important is what am I learning in, this, in, in these skills that I'm developing? Like your, your student, Angela, who, who said, I fell in love with blood, right? right? That is an important judgment about who they are as a person. And the question we want to begin to think is, does knowing how many steps I've taken tell me enough about who I am as a person? We need to learn about this reflective process, but how can technology help do more than just tell us, give us numbers on stuff? Virtual assistance is like Siri. Hello, how can, you know, how can I help you? These automated type of things. So, so that's, that's what they said there. Now, the other thing that they started doing uh, in 2014 is saying, what are trends that are driving higher education, right? And they said, social media and just this integration of the learning process. It's not here is online completely separate from hybrid versus collaborative learning. We're suddenly getting a realization that these are very well integrated in various ways. And is this helpful, folks? Just this little overview, kind of? All right. Um, the next one, data-driven learning and assessment. 
Um, someone was saying they, they're using Learn Smart Labs. Was it right? Learn Smart Labs. A lot of that is actually students performing. They're asking, how well do you know it? You have an assessment. Do they learn it? Can I then drive them to other curriculum if they don't do well? Okay. So that adaptive using data to help adapt the learning process and then shifts fr from students as consumers to students as creators. All right. And I think, I think Paul's point is around how do you engage the students in the learning process and they help design what I need to learn and accomplish. Right? And I think uh, part of the, the goals of Naslow's kind of principle behind it is student as scientist. They're not as observer. They're not as kind of someone who has to listen and regurgitate, it's be engaged, right? I have to create, and I think some of the questions, uh, I think Paul might have made it other people about, oh, um, Kate, thank you, you're upside down, right? The Kate, the Kate said is, is, is right in the photosynthesis, right? It was, I want them to design the stuff so they're creating their own learning experience, right? And so, so those are important aspects. And so those are driving it, and the long-term ones are around agile approaches to change, which is how do we more quickly change the way higher education works? There's tremendous inertia in our administration, in our policies, in the governance process. And then if there's things that we can do quicker, I mean, two years to put that, what that, it, amazing. I know in the CSU, it'd be two years having an argument around this in our <laughs> academic senate, right? Um, but it'd be a thoughtful conversation, though, of course. Right? And then really the evolution of online learning, really seeing the, the changes that, that are occurring. So they're, 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 they're looking at this. Okay. Now, what, what did they say this year, right? Bring your own device, right? And, and in part, I'd say their point around students as consumers, um, really the consuming world is coming into higher education. Everyone's got their own device. And think about 10 years ago, who managed all the computers? that we all had. It was always some IT person that was in a lab someplace, but now we're all bringing our own. We are, in a sense, enabling people to have choices, and their preferences are now being integrated into their learning. Before, I was stuck with whatever computer I was given, but now someone can say, I like a Surface, or I like the iPad, or I like, and that, in a sense, uh, ownership of the learning process I think is very important that, that that's beginning to change here. So it's just not you own your device, it's your device that makes the difference here. And the issue of the flipped classroom. And, and, I, and some of this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this um, a little bit later too, is that flipping the classroom in part is how do you get students to do the homework that they never wanted to do in the first place, right? And the question is flipping it is how do I, how do I give them an experience at home looking at the lecture, and then change the dynamics inside the classroom. And it's not only what I'm doing, but it's also the physical design that's going to be very important. And, and uh, the person who was talking about a hospice care, right? Why do you have to have that in, in uh, space environment to really change the way people are working and interacting, not just kind of the outer space type thing? The flip classroom is very important, okay? Maker spaces, this in a sense, um, uh, students as creator, and not just say, here's a lab I want you to do, but here's a whole set of, here's a workbench, and now you create things that is kind of part of the idea of make something, not just achieve a certain kind of requirement for a course. So, so you're seeing, in a sense, the the ability for students and the technology empowering the learner to do more than what we could have done before. And some of this is around cost, right? It's now becoming easier, wear, more wearable technology, and then what's coming out is the adaptive learning technologies, all right? Again, and I think this is more about the personalization of the, of the learning process. Um, and, uh, this is a huge challenge in trying to figure out how to make learning adaptable because adaptive learning is about knowing what that individual person 
is doing and learning and performing? And then how do I have the algorithm to say, in a sense, a recommender? What do they need based on how that individual is performing? And there's a lots of complicated issues around your knowledge domain, whether you're in you know, biology or physics or chemistry. If they make a wrong answer, in the old days you just say, that's wrong, right? And they got, and they got a point off. But in adaptive technology, the wrong answer is where the gold in figuring out what someone doesn't know, and then that lets you recommend what do I need to deliver them? And so how many of you have gotten kind of um, training in doing uh, test development and item analysis and figuring out all these things, right? Two people, right? Yet if we're going to have, in a sense, adaptive learning, how you design wrong answers are going to be essential to say that means they have certain, like Dan, you were talking about, sometimes pe people have misconceptions. So how do you design a test to reveal the misconceptions so then you know what do I have to give them, what animation would help resolve that misconception, right? Real challenge on understanding what you need to teach. But, and and uh, again, Learn Smart is one of those out there. There's other ones out there too as well. And then again, all, overall this internet of things, everything being connected, not just on your body here, but I can see how everything that I'm doing, my house, my kids, and help you manage your life in various ways. And, and in a sense, the ability, what this internet of things is around, how do we have a knowledge of what's out there so I can make better judgments, how I can make better decisions in, with information rather than in ignorance. And, and so a lot of these technologies, when you think about them, is how, how are they really helping people inform their decisions? So what are some of the short-term drivers that they see? Use of blended learning, de redesigning design, design spaces. And I think, Angela, when you're talking about the new classroom being crunched in versus the lab stuff, people are really thinking that. Growing the measures of learning. Um, how many of your institutions uh, 10 years ago were talking about graduation and, and retention rates as a top priority in your institution? Okay. Yeah. For us in the CSU, it was enrollment, how many students that I have. How quickly that, that, they, that they got out was really not as important an issue. Why? Because funding was determined by how many seats I had in our class, right? And if those students stayed in those seats for a while, I had these high enrollments and I was able to get the, my money into the department or my money into the university because I hit those enrollment targets, right? But now, what becomes important is how quickly are my students achieving the learning outcomes and are they progressing through our curriculum? We've had biology, for example, where we'd have 30, 40 percent of the students getting D's, W, and F grades and then have to retake the course. It's a pretty good way to keep your enrollment up in those courses, right? Oh, but we hold high standards, right? Now the question is, can you actually teach more of your students with more su successful, engaging tools and pedagogy so you can get them to complete the course? Or is it really a question of students are unprepared? And in the old days, we never asked that question. But now when you're beginning to say, how are our students achieving these learning outcomes? How are they completing their course so they get the cert certification, right? This is going to become, I think, more and more important for our institutions. And oh, sorry, I, I screwed up. I mean, of course, I should, you know, OER, pr proliferation, I mean, and, and I think what some of those drivers are, I, I think are around, and I think cost is an important issue in the US, it's different in, in other places, but the, the ability about sharing content is a, I think a very important aspect, and obviously I'm gonna talk a bit more about that too as well.
Okay. So the longer term trends is how do you change the academic culture culture here? And, um, and I'll, I'll be having some fun with that one. And the importance issue of cross-institutional collaboration. I mean, what you have, what CHEO is, and what you folks are here is around sharing practices across institutions, right? Now, what do you think are some of the drivers beside money? They said, oh, we, we have the tech grant that's going to drive us, so let's do these things. But what, what is the other value of cross-institutional collaboration? And, and, so, and when you say leveraging resources, what does that mean? That's right. How you can achieve an outcome without having to pay, own, manage, be fully responsible for it. And in fact, the importance of collaboration is, I think, is going to be an essential element of what will help make our ideas come true. Because the values, I mean, the passion that Angela was talking about, what she's doing, how much she you know, was into this, how do you make that work well? The Naslow's ideas about how do we really enable people to feel and become a scientist with the right engagement process. Okay. So, so these are some of the things. And, and I, I kind of summarized for, for me of all, how all these things are looking forward is really that learning is just not in the classroom that how do we begin to look at learning everywhere for everyone, right? That my office is now with me all the time, whether I like it or not, right? And now how do the tools help me do that? Because I'm trying to manage who I want to become. And free and open learning. I think that the issue of the economic, um, I'll say, disparity that creates barriers for individuals' progression as, an, as who they are as a human being and how they are economically, I think is going to be a very important point. And how, yes, OER has great potential for reuse and leveraging, but the cost issue, I think, is a really important issue. And, and in the CSU, again, I, I mentioned in the past, we have one campus where 80% 80, 80 of our students are, on, are Pell eligible. And they get other students. We have students sleeping in cars. We have students who are going hungry, who are going to our cafeterias where we have food, free food service because they don't have money. And then when you tell them, go buy the biology book that's $200, it doesn't happen, right? And yet these are the people who our job is to enable them to progress. So, so the issue around the cost, I think, is important. And it's also an empowering role for higher education to be in the marketplace. How the demand side of the ecosystem can change the producer side. And I think what Naslow is, is, isn't it higher education saying, here are the tools that we think can empower learning? What Dan did, his animation, you're now a publisher, right? You're now providing a tool that other people can use and empower them to do things that, now you, that, that you've done, and now they can do it too, but they don't have to do all the Camtasia because now they can take that object, integrate it into their learning. All right? That's freeing up people's time. It's not only an issue of money. It's really freeing them up to do a whole range of types of learning. And I think when you look at all these other aspects, flipping the classroom, it's moving to a student-centered or learner-centered. Adaptive technology is learner-centered. Internet of Things, it's all about things that I am using and how it's informing me. Really, the whole issue of tech contextualization of the workforce and e-portfolios. We talked a little bit about that assessment. I think these are going to be very important. Okay. So is this helpful? Just this little broad kind of overview here? Okay. So now, um, so 
I mean, you could talk about the world but, uh, of all these things, but what I really like to go through here is talk a little bit about designing learning spaces, e-portfolios, um, kind of the, an issue about who, we, how we're changing people, as, and not just knowledge, people's knowledge, but about who they are. And then, the, then I'll talk about the future of tact and skills commons. Because you have what you're doing all this effort, so and you put it in this thing. Well, what is it? Gonna, what is this thing going to do? Is it just going to be another dusty report that's a digital version that's stored someplace and no one use? Or what do we have in plan? Would that be useful? Are these type of things helpful? Yeah. Would they be useful? Okay. All right. The first thing um, is where do you go to find redesigned spaces? Do you think you're the first person who ever thought about how we need to move tables around and have stuff like that, right? Yet, you know what? There, there hasn't been a place. Everyone actually has been trying to figure out, how do I redesign? And so what we've done is we're working with a whole variety of people. So the SUNY system, CSU, Merlot, Art Store, all these folks, we got together and we said, why not? And you know, there's stuff about the importance of learning spaces and stuff. We said, why not create a library where you can go and look at all the universities, how they've designed their classrooms, where you can get technical designs, you can see pictures of what it looks like, and you can see what's the pedagogical strategies that people have used in New York, in Alabama, in, in California. Because would that be helpful? It's about the leveraging aspect that becomes so important. Because Cortland State might have had some money to be able to try something out, and you can say, well, how did it work? Right? So FlexSpace, a design, an open access, free to use. We're working on how then do you review the quality of those materials in there, and making sure you have an ability to find materials that helps you design your space. If you're flipping the classroom and you want to have group dynamics, well, what chairs should you use? What whiteboards are, are important? Or what computer technologies, OK? So again, and, and what we try to, in designing this, we try to say, you got to know the technology, how much space you have, and what the pedagogy, because what we want to do is, how do you have learner-centered designs, right? So again, here's kind of how we began thinking about this. And at the top here, there's something called ELI, which is EDUCAUSE Learning Initiative. And there's LSRS, and it, we all love acronyms. This is Learning Space Rating System. So they had a bunch of people who've already kind of thought about, well, how do you evaluate if my learning space is good, right? So they created this learning rating system. And here's just an example. You can say, oh, is there alignment of your learning space with your campus strategy? Is it integrated into your master plan? In a sense, these rubrics are really helpful in helping you reflect on what are exemplary practices. And if you come back around, developing meta cognitive skills, knowledge about my own thinking and processes, knowledge about what I need to learn, and tools like any of these rubrics are really helpful. In, you might be a wonderful biologist, but what do I know about how do I design a lab to make sure it's sustainable, usable, inexpensive to run? Some of these tools that are out there can help you think through that, because we are all, in a sense, masters of multiple responsibilities, because education is the most wickedly complex phenomena that, that there is. You have people, students are changing, faculty are changing, technology are changing, funding is changing, all these aspects. So how you have to, in a sense, know all these different things. So again, these tools are out there. And part of the, the, the idea here is, in this future, when you want to make your ideal, your ideas real, how do you help envision to go from a thought to an action? And these tools can be very helpful here. 
just so you know, there's stuff already up there. Um, we got a lot of uh, materials, and we have vendors who are helping out. So there already is a little something there, but the future is going to be, how does the classrooms that you've designed fit in this? Because when you contribute it, just like contributing your materials into Skills Common, someone else can say, man, that's really cool. I like that. And it's, if you go to flexspace.org, you can log in and you request an account and then you have all these type of things. Um, here's a, a, you know, a classroom, you click on it, they got a bunch of images, some of them have 360 videos, all these really cool things. Okay? And we're working on what are all the critical evaluation components. So again, what's in the future here is if we're going to have if, flex, if uh, flip classrooms are going to be an essential methodology for quality education, then we better start redesigning the spaces so you can take advantage of student or learner-centered activity by having redesigned physical spaces. Okay? All right. All right. Was that helpful? All right. Okay. All right. Next thing um, I'm going to do, and I'll come back in a, a sec, right, is to talk a little bit about um, uh, is a part of the future was about students creating things, right? Whether they're creating their lab reports, right? They're designing those things, or they're in their maker spaces, or um, they're um, uh, uh, designing methodologies for testing because people have questions, there might be things that, that you, you have to go against certain conventions, there might be new ways you're doing it. So, um, and, and I think um, e-portfolios, if you think about what they are, it, it's an attempt to take the work that has been invisible for students, right? All their term papers, whoever knows that, what those things done, or their projects that, that they may have done, right? It, that has been the, uh, the, the disposable materials that, that Paul talked about. But how then do you make all their learning, their products, visible? Allow them to create their own e-portfolio, right? Show me what you've done. Create video of what you've done. Put your lab report in there. Explain how you've done this. Take pictures. I mean, the tools that they now have to provide evidence of what they've done is important. Now, how, how do you move that into an academic culture? I say, let's begin with faculty having them develop e-portfolios. When I'm redesigning my class, have you ever told Kate, you know, we have these verbal, we have these stories that we tell, kind of tribal knowledge, but have you ever kind of created a a, a digital poster of how you've redesigned your teaching of that class? Or Dan, have you kind of told that story where someone doesn't have to be in the room? How, how would they know all these critical things that, that you've done? Well, I mean, you're, like the first day, you sort of talk about who you are. Right, right. That's, that's it. Yeah, but, and, and we have these conversations, but what happens because if we don't create digital memories, as an institution, we come amnesic, right? I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I use memories and you know, things that, as metaphors. But it is amazing how many innovations have been created and lost and forgotten in someone's laptop folder, etc. No one knows what all the great things you did. So how can you make that visible? How do you kind of add that to our scholarly effort? And in part, uh, what I'll say is what we're doing in the Cal State system, and I'll just show you just a little glimpse of having faculty tell stories about how they're redesigning their courses and how the impact is on students. Is that okay. kind of what LinkedIn's trying to do a little bit? Um, to give you a space? Yeah. Right, and, and, and it's, about, it's, it's more about who you are in your portfolio of your kind of credentials as compared to what did I actually do in redesigning this. So, so Dan, and, and I'll say it, it's, we could 
create a, an ability for Dan to tell his, his digital story and then post it up in a library so you can say, I'm interested in how someone in chemistry is looking at um, changing the way they're teaching with animations. Would you like to, in a sense, to be able to have a library to see who else is in, uh, has been teaching fl uh, phlebotomy classes and what they're doing? Would that be pretty cool? Or anatomy and physiology and how they've changed that? Okay. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is if the future is around faculty sharing pedagogical practices about how they're changing and we have no mechanism to share that, we're never going to move forward as an institution. Okay. So what, what I'm going to show you the, in the Cal State system, um, we have a project called Course Redesign and, a, and the basic premise, the reason for this is that um, we have, quote, bottlenecks where students are not progressing toward graduation in a timely way. And so the, uh, we were providing uh, a good deal of funding uh, after about a billion dollars cut in our budget from uh, California, they said, here's 10 million to fix all the problems, right? Um, and so, uh, so we had to say, where, right, uh, wh where do we begin? So we started saying, what are the courses that are causing most of our problems? And, and I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just pick one. So, so we gave funding to faculty members to rethink the way they're teaching their courses and I'm pushing OER to think about all this other stuff. So, but what we had them do is tell their story with an e-portfolio, right? So here's Kelly and, and a, a number of other part-time instructors at Cal State Long Beach, right? And they said, why did I need to redesign this course? What are some of the activities that I've had? What are the obstacles that I'm facing? And on the right-hand side, she actually has some Camtasia videos of little parts of the body and all this other stuff like that, bones of the thorax, things like that. So it's creating these OER type things. Um, you know, what are the newly, uh, newly created class time to engage students, how she flipped the classroom? In a sense, the stories that were, were part of our oral tradition are now becoming part of a digital tradition. And now you don't have to have the person tell the story all the time. So in these digital stories, and, and what uh, Kelly has over here is also kind of what's happening to their grade distribution over time. So you can say, hey, is, are these changes making any difference? And, and over here, you know, this is after the course redesign. I, this is 40% of the students were getting D's, WF's in the class, right? And now after this, she's down to 20, right? Now she's going to continue doing and all this other stuff. But would you likely have met Kelly, Kate? Sure, I'm invited to. Yeah, but, but would there be, before we had this conversation, would you have any way of knowing how would you find this out? Okay, and I think, this is what I, what I want to say, to make our future real is how do we have to begin to change our own behavior and begin to tell our stories with e-portfolios. And once we begin to see the value of it, I think what we're going to do is we're going to see, well, why don't our students tell their e-portfolios e of how they're creating their materials? Okay. So all these things, there's a lot of information in here. Right, more about her and stuff like that, next steps, right? And just so you know, they choose what, um, uh, this is not an open, they, they, they choose what their Creative Commons license, so they have a non-derivative on this, right? Now, how are these created? All these are created with a, f a free tool in Merlot, it's called Merlot Content Builder, and we actually, when you create these e-portfolios, you actually are forced to put a Creative Commons license on them. So now it's open for people to distribute and use. Okay. And just to know that there's a lot of other stuff on this website. I'll, I'll send it around, stuff like that. But, but the idea around this institution, right? Cal State is doing this stuff. You think, you think the CSU is the only one doing course redesign? There's hundreds, right? But what are we not doing? 
We're not doing that institutional sharing. We're not creating digital assets. We're not creating open educational resources, not just of our instructional materials, but our pedagogical expertise of how we're changing. Because, I mean, I, I look at that and I'd say, man, I can get some good ideas. Whether I'm teaching anatomy and physiology or not, I can really see how, my, how I might be able to play with that. And, and we have 100, 150 e-portfolios, because now every time I pay faculty members to do something, they got to produce an e-portfolio. And then we're going to we catalog them. And now there's a library. We're going to create a, a library within Merlot of not just how do you find learning objects, instructional materials, but how do I find pedagogical content expertise? That then you can say, oh, can I find a biologist who's done a course redesign? And rather than Google it, because that's not likely to pop up on a high on the list, but these are the services, in a sense, that Merlot and ultimately Skills Commons will, will put in place. OK. Um, okay. The, the, the next point I, I want to make is, is around, and, and what I heard so often here is around, how do you teach people not information, right? When you spend your time lecturing, you're saying, what am I saying? But when you spend your time in a lab experiment, helping having them design it, it's like, how do I teach the student who I have in my class? What do they need to know? What are the misconceptions they have? It's always knowing what do they need, not what I have to say. And this shift of my role to their role is, I think, a very important shift that's occurring. When I said the, the Gestalt, the learner centered design process, I think the future is driving more toward who, what are the learning that's occurring in the class, not what am I performing in the class. The learner analytics, the drive for retention, more and more focus. And, and what I'm going to talk a little bit now, this might sound a little odd for, for the situation, but there's something called the bystander effect in psychology. Anybody know what the bystander effect is? Bystander effect? Um, not quite, but sometimes it, it can play into that. So let's say um, uh, I f uh, in this situation, if I, fall right, if I fell down right now, most of the time someone up here would have probably say, hey, Jerry, you're, you're right at least, right? But uh, the bystander effect is when you're in a social situation, something occurs, right? Someone falls down, someone might be sick. The classic story is about Kitty Genovese in the early 20th century was murdered in a New York alleyway and there was 100 people looking from all the apartments and no one called the police, right? And the idea is, is that when you're in a social situation, often the social conventions prevent you from taking action and going against convention and helping someone out. So there's a mindset, and, and there's some really cool social psychological research that's out there. And I'll just, a really quick one. Do you think people will, f will flee a room that's on fire? Except when other people don't move, right? And a quick experiment, they would put someone in a room, then they'd start pumping um, smoke into the room. The person immediately says, what the heck's going up? I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, right? And they were taking an exam or, or uh, filling out an application. But if you stick four other people in the room, they're all Confederates, you do the same thing, the person looks around, see what's up, smoke's coming in, and they're just all sitting there. And the person still does that, right? The issue of the, the conventions of me as a social person and how do I not step out is going to be very important. And if we want our students to step out, in a sense, to be a hero, how do you go against convention? And if you're going to be a scientist, right, don't you have to question convention? So this is a little social, kind of the psychology of the being student-centered, I think, is going to be, become more important for us because the social conventions can prevent us from students becoming 
the scientist because they'll just be bystanders in their own learning. So just what's out there, just so you know, there's uh, something called the Heroic Imagination Project. Okay? A guy named Phil Zimbardo, uh, he did work in the, um, um, in, uh, the late 60s um, around um, putting people as prison guards or as uh, prison, uh, or inmates, and you find the evil things that people do in social situations is amazing, right? Okay. So he's, he said, you know what, I'm tired of doing research on the evil things. How do we do research on the heroic things? How do I step out? And how does a student help another student in a group project rather than be a bystander when they're struggling? Okay. So just to, uh, so if you go to heroicimagination.org, and one of the things that we're doing is we're saying, listen, how do you get students be hip deep in heroic actions? How do you take small steps? And, I'm, and what I'm just going to, you get your students to start thinking as, as a hero. And what I'm going to show you here is just how technology can be used to help people have a forum to show off their heroic actions and have social situations reinforce those. So this is, again, an open tool. Merlot is free and open for you to use in various ways. And we say, how, does, how do you become a leader to do heroic activities, right? And so we created this open platform. Again, the, the purpose here is to get you to think about, if I want my students to be heroes in science, how might I want to get them, uh, how might I lead a project that might be heroic in various ways? So how might I set up a community where my students tell each other how they've stepped out of line and challenged a convention or challenged a bullying or, or, or been nice to someone, whatever it might be. Planning projects, stuff like that. This, in, I think, is a, a chance, an opportunity where open educational services, the open platforms that enable people to create things, can be used for heroic actions of our students because that's what they need to change to a little bit. Okay. And, and this, these are, again, simple things, and, and we have them do Facebook, Twitter, all this other stuff like that. And, and you say, it's, it's got to be hip to be a hero, right? That it's good to step out of line rather than not. You've heard the saying, distance education begins in the third row of the classroom? <laughs> right? Okay? All right? Because the, the psychological distance beca can become a challenge here. So, Again, if we're thinking about this future of how do we make our students more creative, more engaging, we have to deal with the social situation of them being bystanders in their own learning. You know, okay, okay, and and so we, we again uh, we we have tools that 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 help you do this. We call them community conversations, and you can do a, we do this in K twelve. People show off their stuff. Okay. So, all right, so, so how, how do we make these changes? If we're going to have a major, f really, change in control where we want our students to be much more engaging, more empowered, to take responsibility, and also, I would say, control of faculty, too, about what our roles are going to be, how do we make this happen? Okay. And, and anybody know the story? Stone soup, okay. Um, and I, I'm going to tell it. Um, for those who may not, but also to draw upon um, certain principles. Okay. So um, there's a, um, three soldiers coming back from the war, late 1700s. They're tired and they're hungry. And they're you know, coming over a hill and then they see a village. And they go, oh boy, that village looks nice. Their, their fields are green. Maybe when we go there, we'll ask them for some food and water. Right? And so they start you know, walking down the path, and then the villagers spy the soldiers. And what do they say? Ah, oh, soldiers are coming. They're gonna, take, they're gonna take our food, our water. They're gonna cause a problem. All right? so let's tell them we have nothing and tell them go to the next village. So the soldiers come into town. The mayor comes out kind of looking tired and hungry and stuff. And the soldiers go, you know, we're tired, we're hungry. We've had a long journey. We're trying to make our way home. Do you have a little food or water to help us out? And the mayor goes, oh, sorry, 
you know, it's been a terrible year. Um, we're, we're hungry too, but the next village is much better. Why don't you just move on? So then the soldier, one of the soldiers goes, ah, I see, just like you and we are hungry, we have a solution. We'll show you how to make stone soup. And they state, stone soup? Making soup from stones? We'll never go hungry. Let's ask, right? And, and they said, okay, tell us how to make stone soup. And the soldiers will get the largest pot, put it in the middle of the village, put the wood around it, bring the, put water, bring it to boil, and then we'll, we'll take care of the rest. So then the three soldiers go out to the fields, find their unique stones, and, and suddenly all the other villagers are going, what's going on? They're gathering around. And the soldiers put the stones in one, two, three. And everyone's saying, oh, what's going to happen now? And then the first soldier goes, you know, if we only had a little bit of carrots, it would really help out. And someone goes, oh, I got carrots. They run home, chop it up, bring it in, throw it into the soup, into the water. And, and everyone goes, oh, they're right. Can you smell it? And then the next soldier goes, oh, if we only had some cabbage, it would really help. And someone goes, oh, I have cabbage. They run home, chop it up, put it in, right? And then it goes, we only had a little pepper. We only had a little beef. We only had a little, right? Then all these ingredients get put in. And then you have this marvelous stew. The mayor goes, we're going to have a celebration. Everyone pull out the tables. Let's have a party. Doesn't matter whether you contribute or not. You're gonna, we're going to have a celebration that we now know how to make stone soup. They had a great time. Soldiers get put up in the best houses. And the next morning they leave and, and the, the mayor goes, thank you so much for teaching us how to make stone soup. Right. All right. So was that about the story you heard growing up at Captain Kangaroo for the older folks? And I'm not sure where the younger folks heard that one. OK. Now, it's been a while, Beth. Yeah. You guys are right. right. Um, now, what? It really is a metaphor for change management, all right? And Kate, you asked, how do you get people to adopt Naslo Lab, right? Okay. And, and I think um, I, I've, been, I've been involved with um, uh, Merlot since 90, well, before it was Merlot, right? So it's like 18 years officially and stuff like this. And, and I'm asking the same question around the adoption of digital technology and various ways like that. And so, so what, what I think here, the story of Stone Soup really provides some critical elements to your change management process. And, and Maria, when you're talking about how do you sustain this stuff and all, I mean, I think some of these things might be helpful here. The first thing, what's really important, is you have to and find ways of engaging people and opening their doors, right? And one of the critical things that this event here does it got you out of your office, right, and brought you together, and you now had an interaction that you don't normally have. You started engaging people, asking, questioning, and that's going to be the critical aspect of how do you open your doors to meet new people. And it might not always be physical. It can be digital. You can have these, and again, these online communities, conversations going on where some stuff goes on, right? And then, because uh, now when the soldiers came into town, the first thing they said was, you know, you know um, can, can I have something? And they said, no, we don't. And, and the soldiers say, I see you're hungry like we are, recognizing what the needs of people are, right? And so this becomes a really important aspect when you try to do an intervention is saying, what do the people need? not what I have to give, right? And I know it's a, there's, a, there's a flip side of that, but recognizing those needs and say, are you ready, right? When they went down to the village, they saw the fields were green. They, it wasn't that the fields were all dead and, and you know, stuff like that. And, and that's part of an important step is, what do people need and what are they ready to do? So some of the questions are, what are they ready to adopt? And it might be just a little thing. It may not be a big thing, right? So trying to figure that one out. And being explicit about that, validating those needs become important. All right. 
and I think th this is a, an, a really important aspect around change processes, exciting people's curiosity, right? How are you going to make soup from stones, right? Okay. How, like Dan said, he val you volunteered, right? And you joked a little bit around it, right? right? Now, wh what, why did you volunteer? Number one, because I wanted to make something good. And number two, I had never really built any good graphics before. And I was like, well, I might as well try. Right, and, and so you, you, you said, boy, I wonder if I could do that, right? Right? Exciting people's curiosity is really important because you have to have a motivation for change, right? And if they don't say, I wonder, how the heck could that happen? Why, why would that be any better than what I'm doing now, right? You got to say, there's got to be a reason. And that's often what we don't do enough do is excite someone's curiosity. Man, this, this could be really cool, right? Okay. Right. Now, when they came in, the, the soldiers didn't say, put the pot in, in the mayor's house, right? Put it in the open, right? Because what's really important is you have to, be get, you have, to have a gathering place. And, and whether it's on, in an online website, so the point is, where do I find this stuff, right? What's your library? Is that a gathering place of academic content? Right? Think about your department meetings, they're gathering places. So when you're looking at change, how do you make sure you, you create a gathering place in the open so people have a chance to choose to look in? Right? Okay. And that's why some of the value of open educational resources is I don't have to have a special password, I don't have to have a special handshake, I don't have to have enough money. I, it's open for me to be able to use that. Okay. Okay. Now, in the story, the soldier didn't say, hey, Angela, go get the carrots, right? It said, you know, if we only had some carrots, right? Okay. And this is an important aspect about, and, and, and someone decided it's what they had. So when you're looking at some of these projects, how do you really invite people to give what they can, not what they don't. And that's where the invitation becomes very important, right? Okay. And it's a personal aspect, right? Okay. And, and I think I know Dan's point was around, you know, I wanted to see if I can do that and see if I could make a contribution to this, right? And, and not just connecting. Um, are disembodying what the contributions are. And so, you know, because I, I heard your question, there was real, uh, I'll say, um, real desire to answer that question. How do I get someone to do this, to, to try this stuff out, and trying to figure out what is it by them doing that they can contribute, that, that they can create something new that they never would have been able to, done, to do before, right? Okay. And I think the other point about leveraging is everybody didn't have to put everything in. Someone put a little carrot, someone put a little beef, right? And, and that's the only way stone soup gets made, right? And actually, I think that's the only way that open education resources are going to really function very well, is we can have all the ingredients in our own homes, but if you don't find a way to bring it together and share, it's going to be difficult. And encouraging publicity, right? It's in the middle. People said, hey, look at all this stuff. So what are you doing to get the word out about these things? So you have different marketing uh, strategies. Enjoying the fruits of the labor, have a party. Celebrate people's accomplishments at the end of the year. And then make sure you say thank you. Right. Now, how many of you have, do you often get people saying thank you for all the hard work, the late nights, anything like that? Right? Not, not, not enough, right? All right. And, and some of the, the way of getting the more thank yous is to make sure you say thank you to other people too. There's the social reciprocity of building, in a sense, more 
again, heroic actions is how do, what am I doing to help make someone else's life just a little bit better, right? So was this uh, and, and helpful here just to help have this little story about change management type things? It was good? Okay. Because it's our future because it's not going to come about if we don't change the way our institutions work, if we don't change the way our leaders uh, support people, we don't change the inspiration to bring out the curiosity to do the invitation rather than the direction. Okay. Now, um, what, what this is, so when, when I'm in front of a board of trustees or my boss, I don't tell them the stone soup story, right? Um, uh, but so, so what, what, what I talk to them about is um, really about strategies that, ta that you have to think about. And, and when you're looking at this change, how do you leverage all your content providers? All you folks that are out there, your libraries, there's publishers, you're creating things, there's open education resources. All right, and, and I, I'd say that you're working on that. The next really important thing that that becomes is you got to make people's lives easier, right? And so when you're thinking about the future, want to make a change, what, how can you make things more convenient and affordable? And, and this, anybody feel like this? Running with scissors, right? With the bullet holes, right? This actually was our logo um, for this course redesign. And, and always thinking about giving a gift and not a burden, right? What is it? in the story validating people's needs, what do they need, how can I give them, showing exemplary uh, practices, that's what you folks have been doing here, giving choices, and, and that's uh, I think a very powerful aspect. If you want someone to take ownership, to feel it's a personal contribution, you need to give them a choice of what to do. And that's why the invitation. Think globally, link globally is, is uh, I mean, build locally, sorry, Link globally is around the leveraging process and make sure you manage things right, okay? Now I'm gonna zip through, we have a lot of stuff on, on how we customize, we save stuff. Now what's happening in Skills Commons is gonna highlight just a few things. Four minutes? Okay, all right. This is uh, really important. Um, if you wanna run fast, go alone. You wanna run far, you gotta go together. And this is definitely a cooperative activity. And one of the things, what's coming up, um, uh, when, when I, uh, we got involved basically last June um, in, um, in the TAC program. And our first step was to say, how do we find a place for you to put your stuff, right? And so right now, Skills Commons is a content repository, a library where you can catalog your things and, and People are just sometimes putting a 300 megabyte zip file of three courses in there, right? Okay, so at least we're storing it. But the next part of what we're doing is really how do we make it easy for people to discover these things, right? And, and that's, that's a whole different aspect. I can go into Skills Commons right now and find all the Word documents and PowerPoints, but what it takes to find that is a real pain in the neck. It's like um, a package that's wrapped and then there's another package inside. It's like those, um, those dolls that, that are one and, and you're nesting. nesting dolls, right? And, and how would I ever find out what, what the treasure is inside? So one of the things we're doing is we're actually going to create open learning management system platforms where the courses will actually be displayed in the format that you've been creating them in. So in a, again, I worked with Angela and Beth yesterday around, so, so your D2L course that you're gonna wrap up and zip in, that be able to display it so someone can see it in its native, and you can say, oh, I like that, and then I would say, oh, I want that, that Word document of that procedure that, that you have. You can take other people's material, leverage all that content, using tools, create a more interactive exp experience, put it back up on Skills Commons, and then someone takes it the next step. What we're going to be doing in Skills Commons is providing what we call these makeover strategies. 
take stuff that's in there, allow other people to kind of get to the next version, put it in there, and now the, the, uh, the original author can say, man, that's pretty cool, I like that, I want to use that one instead, because they had the time to do, go take it to the next step. So again, as the stone soup, someone puts in the carrots, someone puts in the cabbage, and together you're going to get a whole lot more. So when we're looking at that, now how, the, how all this is going to occur is through the building of disciplined communities. Right? And, and that's what we see really in the end of this year and beginning of next year, the start of building those communities. Out.